che adesso chiamerei sul palco Emily Matheisen, o Matheisen, purtroppo non Matheisen, facciamole un applauso. Ecco, grazie Emily. E Emily lavora per l'International Coalition Habitat, che è basata in Egitto. È un'organizzazione che si occupa, è una rete globale che lotta per la giustizia sociale, l'uguaglianza di genere e la sostenibilità ambientale e lavora per la difesa, la promozione e la realizzazione dei diritti umani. Ecco, Emily, una, una, una domanda centrale, un aspetto centrale del suo intervento sarà proprio la, quella che anche Olivier de Schutter nella sua relazione finale ha chiamato la democrazia del cibo. Cioè non c'è alternativa se non c'è una democrazia alimentare. Ecco, cosa ne, cosa ne pensi? Ok. Thank you, everybody. Um... So my name is Emily, I'm coming from the Housing and Land Rights Network in Egypt, which is part of Habitat International Coalition. And I was given a very broad topic. Um, and there's a lot of different aspects that I could discuss this issue from, but I think for me it's most appropriate to discuss how my organization has experienced um, and the different challenges we've had in inclusion in different uh, processes related to governance. Um, so before I, before I begin, uh, I think it's really important to discuss my organization because I think it is a bit different than most of the organizations that are here. Um, so Habitat International Coalition, you can see some of my uh, wonderful colleagues from Colombia there, is a, an organization, uh, a network of some 400 different social movements, community-based organizations, and some professional associations working on different aspects of land, housing, and also the right to the city. And so for us, um, which will, and the right to the city, of course, includes the right to food. And for us, we see um, participatory planning and issues, uh, many issues that were just actually discussed with Javier, connecting rural and urban areas is critical to moving forward on realizing the right to food along with other human rights that we, we cannot forget are connected, such as housing, the rights to land, right to health, right to water, all of these issues which, which we've been discussing. And because of this, uh, I guess, specialization our network has, um, we are the organization that coordinates the urban constituency within the, the Committee on World Food Security, within the civil society mechanism. And I think that many of us here are somehow directly or peripherally involved in the civil society mechanism, but I don't think anybody has explained it yet. So um, we've heard a lot of acronyms, <laughs> but don't really understand the process. Um, so for us, uh, the people working in the civil society mechanism, we believe that the Committee on World Food Security is the place, the only place in international policy where we should discuss food. As we heard, the WTO is not where we discuss food. And this is the place where we also, as civil society, have a space, a space that we have fought for very hard and that we maintain and that we are represented uh, in all the different constituencies, from pastoralists, peasants, uh, fishing communities, indigenous peoples, consumers, urban poor, um, and all, as well as the NGOs that offer us support. Um, and, and through this mechanism, we've really achieved a lot, but we also really have seen the limits of multi-stakeholderism, and this is a problem as well, and it's something that I think other people have brought up, and that there's some serious power dynamics that we still have to confront and still have to be very aware of. Um, but in any case, for us, this is the, the model that we should be discussing decisions, whether it's at the international level or the local level. And so for, for us, if we are here to discuss having a radical shift in the food system, we are really discussing creating local food systems, or I guess relocalizing our food system. And so for me, the question I have is if we have a, an expectation that at the international level we have all of these spaces, and we have this expectation of complete inclusion, why do we not have this expectation at the, the, the local level? And of course, we've heard some cases where we are having success, but it's not um, as strong yet. And maybe 
for us at Habitat International Coalition, we sort of have some ideas about things that we really need to change in order to better realize inclusion at the local <coughs> level. Um, and, and, and I guess this would go into two parts. The first is we need to um, reconceptualize what we understand is urban and rural. Or rather, we don't need to separate them so much because it's not reflecting reality and it's not reflecting the way our local food system should be working. And second, uh, we need to reflect on our relationship with local government and local authorities. And for us, um, working through the Right to the City platform, which is a, a network of several social movements, um, this has been a really important issue that we've been discussing. Okay. And so for, for us, the, the way we focus on this issue is reconceptualizing the urban areas as city regions. So, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in order to, I'm sorry, I'm not a big mic. <laughs> okay. Because a lot of the work that we're doing now, it's been really clear that urban and rural people, in particular marginalized and vulnerable populations, sometimes we're saying urban and rural poor, are suffering from the same forces that completely disadvantage them and remove them from benefiting from the current system. And oftentimes governments are treating them as separate or competing with each other. And this is a core issue that I think we've also identified in the past few days that we really need to discuss. And also really reinforces why we need to build alliances here. Um, within different international policy processes, uh, where food is being discussed, um, and the CFS, of course, is somehow involved, and a lot of the actors here are also involved, there's been a reconceptualization of the city as the city region. And some important uh, movements that have happened in that is the first with um, goal 11 of the Sustainable Development Goals. We're often looking at goal two, which is on food and, and hunger. But on goal 11 is actually where uh, the issues of land tenure will come up. The issues of linking rural and urban areas will come up. How do we build sustainable communities? And how do we involve local authorities and, uh, and encourage them, or I guess make, make them fulfill their mandate to uphold state obligations and human rights? The second is the preparations towards Habitat 3. Habitat 3 is a UN-wide conference or summit that happens every 20 years on human settlements as well. And this is uh, another area where now they are actually discussing food systems. The FAO is involved, EFAD is involved. So we also need to be involved because if we are not part of that discussion, we are really losing and missing an opportunity to really change the way we have expectations for local authorities, but also for our state governments in the way that they engage in urban planning and then the w in the way that cities are, are functioning, including issues of public procurement, uh, food waste and loss, issues of uh, school feeding programs, all of these really important policies and social protection mechanisms that a lot of us are working on. Okay. And so a big challenge that a lot of us have faced in international policy processes is actually having local authority responsibility in the policy decisions. Um, for example, in the Committee on World Food Security, there is no space for local authorities. There is no, mm, they've tried and sometimes they, they, par they par participate as observers, but they're not actually given a voice to to share their challenges in making policy, their challenges in implementing policy. But for us as civil society, it's very important that we have the opportunity to write them into the decision-making processes so when we go home, we can hold them directly accountable to carrying out the, the policy decisions and implementing some of the really good things that we've accomplished in international processes. Specifically, I want to bring up something that did happen last year and we did have a, a very big success with, which was the food, food Losses and Waste Policy Roundtable. And a few people in, in the audience were involved in this as well. <laughs> and this was a, a very contentious issue because of course the private sector has a very vested interest in this, uh, this subject. And, as, and governments are, uh, 
it's a normal process where there's a lot of nervosity involved. But in this one in particular, one of the most contentious issues that we spent several hours, several hours negotiating, was this sentence you see in bold, which is states and, as appropriate, subnational and local authorities should. And that, usually they just say states. And for us, this was absolutely critical because this is the first time that such a, mm, a decentralized uh, mandate was put in a CFS decision, decision. And it's really critical that in some very important work streams we have coming up on water, on connecting smallholders to markets, as well as implementing past CFS de decisions, including the 10-year guidelines, which many of us are working on, we need to understand and make it very clear that local authorities do have a responsibility to carry out the principles that are inside of these policy documents and that they do have human rights obligations. Um, and for us, this is, this is not a new thing. And, and in the Right to the City movement, we've been working on this for a very long time. Um, I, I just put this on the screen, but I, I won't read it. But in 1996, during the Habitat 2 Summit, states signed a document and a declaration that said that local authorities are our closest allies in essentially creating sustainable development. And this has not been realized. And as we're preparing for the next process, this has completely been erased, and the local authorities are really fighting for a space as well, and often trying to find... Um, seeing us more of an ally than their national government. And so I think that this sort of uh, understanding of decentralization really needs to be better understood by states. Additionally, um, we've been working with the Human Rights Council and many other, other organizations, including some working on food directly, are feeding into a UN-wide process to discuss the human rights obligations of local authorities. And this is really important because if if we want to be part of the decisions that are made at the local level and be a, an active participant in a meaningful way, we need to ensure that they understand what that means, what human rights obligations mean, and what they can actually do to implement uh, and operationalize these um, uh, obligations. And this will be finalized this year as well. As well as there's some very interesting, um, I don't know, local, I'm calling it local global uh, initiatives because it's these global networks of um, governments and authorities that are coming together and putting policies forward because for them they don't see a place for them in any of this discussions and they don't understand how they can carry out the mandates that they should have and so they've taken their own initiatives and they're often asking us to be a part of it and unfortunately the the food sovereignty community hasn't been as strong as it should be in these in these deci decision making processes and some very important and newer ones that are, uh, could be very useful to our different struggles. The first is the World Charter on the Right to the City. This is a civil society driven um, charter. It comes out of the World Social Forum and has been signed by many cities or city networks that are interested to understand their human rights obligations on a local level. And now we're in the process of rewriting this charter and opening it back up to include food systems, to include solidarity economy, to include all of these other critical things that aren't strong enough. And, in, and we also have had some success at creating local um, human rights charters in Mexico City and Sao Paulo and Guangzhou in Korea. The second is a very recent document called the Seoul Declaration that came out of uh, a local cities meeting uh, cities network meeting and in this document some 100 cities committed to um, you can see up there commitments to city region cooperation city region food systems local economy and improved procurement policies and these are things that we can really use to hold these cities accountable and to also uh, push our national governments to better understand uh, local food systems and local governance generally and the last, uh, I believe someone from the city of Milan was here yesterday and briefly mentioned, is the Urban Food Policy Pact. This pact is a really important mechanism for us. And the people working on this are mostly from civil society and or who are uh, facilitating the process and a few academics. 
And I was lucky to be asked to be part of the team that facilitates the portions of the pact that are on social and economic equity. And what the process has entailed is a discussion with cities to share their challenges and to share what problems they're facing in developing policy uh, for local food systems. And it also involves a commitment to creating local food systems. And so this will be finalized uh, in October. But I think that there is a very keen interest to actually follow through and interact directly with civil society, to interact with farmers outside of the city, to connect rural and urban peoples and, and actually discuss how we can actually change um, the food system at a local level, which is what, in the end, we are really asking for. And so I think that amongst us, we ourselves are, are really working towards not working in silos. And we're asking our governments to do that. And I just really urge us to ask governments at all levels to not do this. And that we really try to pay attention to the different processes outside of Rome. Because food advocacy is not only in Rome. And we really need to ensure that we are everywhere that these discussions are happening. Thank you very much.